In this video, I will be talking about vitamin D in details. So if you want to follow along with me, please feel free to do so by going to page 99, First Aid 2012. Now we all know that vitamin D is used for um, absorption of calcium, right? Or calcium or bone mineralization. Vitamin D is used for bone mineralization. So we have to know how we get vitamin D in our system. We can get vitamin D two ways. Either we can make vitamin D in our body or we can eat things that has vitamin D. Now first of all, let's talk about how vitamin D is made in our body. Now, vitamin D is made up of cholesterol, okay? Cholesterol is present in our skin, in our cell membranes, all over our body. But in our skin, cholesterol is present in the form called 7-dehydrocholesterol. And in ex when, when sun hits our skin, 7-dehydrocholesterol is converted to cholecalciferol. Cholecalciferol is D3. That form is called D3. Cholecalciferol then goes to the liver, and in the liver, with the, with the help of the enzyme 25-hydroxylase, cholecalciferol is converted to 25-hydroxycholecalciferol. Makes sense. 25-hydroxycholecalciferol. Simple. Now, 25-hydroxycholecalciferol then travels from the liver all the way to the kidney. And then, in the kidney, there is an enzyme called 1-alpha-hydroxylase, which is going to convert our 25-hydroxycholecalciferol to 1-25-dihydroxycholecalciferol. Now, 1-25-dihydroxycholecalciferol is also called calcitriol. That is the active form of vitamin D. That is the form of vitamin D we need for our bones. Okay, now whenever we take vitamin D, in, we ingest vitamin D from different sources, this is not the form. Active form is not the form uh, we get it in, okay? We get it in other forms. For example, when we take over-the-counter vitamin D, it is usually in the form of cholecalciferol. So if you do not have um, an active uh, liver and an active kidney, you are not going to be able to metabolize your cholecalciferol to 125-dihydroxycholecalciferol because you still need the metabolism in the liver and in the kidney. Okay, so over-the-counter drugs, uh, over-the-counter uh, vitamin D is only going to work if you have a functional kidney and a functioning functional liver. Someone who is going through liver failure or kidney failure, for them, um, a doctor can prescribe active form of 125-hydroxycholecalciferol or calcitriol so that they can directly get the active form and they do not need to metabolize. Okay, so that was how we make it in our body, in our, from our skin to the liver to the kidney. But what about ingestion? What if we take uh, different forms of vitamin D? If we ingest it from plants, the, the vitamin D from the source of plants is called D2. It's called Argo calciferol. When we ingest it from milk, that is in the form of cholecalciferol or D3. So the following has to go through. And the storage form is usually 25-hydroxy D3. That's going to be the storage form of vitamin D. Now let's talk about how vitamin D is absorbed in our body. There is two ways vitamin D is absorbed. Sorry. How, let's talk about how vitamin D absorbs calcium in our body. Now really, there is principally two ways. One is in the intestine, one is in the kidney, okay? But the intestine one is the one that is pri it's used primarily. So what happens is we have our active form of vitamin D, the calcitriol, 125-dihydroxycholecalciferol. It goes to our colon. Exactly where does it go? It goes to, it goes to our jejunum. It goes to jejunum and it's going to absorb calcium with the help of 125-hydroxycholecalciferol. And that calcium is used to, mineral, to mineralize our bone. Okay? Um, here. It's used to mineralize our bone. Now that's what happens at the level of the jejunum. But what about kidney? So what happens in our kidney? In our kidney, 
this 125 hydroxychloroquine also comes and it absorbs uh, it absorbs calcium from our kidney as well but it does it in a little bit different form than it does it in the in the colon obviously it works with a receptor and that receptor is called PTH receptor now where exactly in the kidney do we have our PTH receptor we have our PTH receptor in our DCT right in our DCT so imagine that this is our PTH receptor now the PTH receptor here usually sodium is reabsorbed okay so calcium has to is reabsorbed in the similar mechanism so when sodium is reabsorbed calcium has to somehow sneak in as much as possible at the level of kidney so that's why when we use drugs such as thiazide which blocks the sodium receptors those receptors are used to absorb more and more calcium there you know calcium can freely absorb I mean, it doesn't have to sneak in anymore you can use all those receptors that was used to reabsorb sodium is now reabsorbing calcium that's why when we use thiazide we have hypercalcemia okay this thiazide is also used uh, to decrease kidney stones because if we reabsorb more calcium there's going to be less calcium in our tubules and there's going to be less chances of having kidney stones in our tubules okay so how is cal uh, uh, calcium absorbed in the body in the colon with the help of 125 dihydroxychloroquine and also at the level of DCT with the help of the PTH receptor by the way just an added information here PTH receptor absorbs calcium at the level of DCT, but it absorbs phosphorus at the level of PCT. Very, very important distinction. Okay, at the level of colon, when the vitamin D is reabsorbing calcium, it is also reabsorbing something else. It's also reabsorbing phosphorus because mineralization of the bone not only needs calcium, it also needs phosphorus. So they reabsorb at the same rate at the same time. So now let's talk about uh, drugs. Uh, sometimes uh, some drugs, which are P450 inhibitors, they work in the, in the liver. So P450 inhibitors, sorry, inhibitors or inducers. Let's talk about inducers first. The inducers, what do they do? They rev up P450. If they rev up P450, all the liver enzymes are going to be used up. So as a result, if you, if you are taking a drug that is an inducer, it's going to rev up all these enzymes, in, sorry, not this one, the one in the, kit, one in the liver, going to rev up this enzyme and you're going to have lack of 25 hydroxylase. As a result, if you're taking a drug which is a P450 inducer, then you can have vitamin D deficiency because you're not going to have the normal synthesis of vitamin D. Okay, now that's that's out of the way. The last thing I want to talk about is the relationship of PTH, osteoblast, osteoclast, and vitamin D. Now imagine that this is our bone. Vitamin D has receptors in our bone. When vitamin D goes and binds to this receptor, the bone releases alkaline ph phosphatase. Okay? And we pick it up in the serum, in the test from our serum. Now, the receptor for vitamin D and the receptor for PTH are different. You know, it's different location, different site, all different. When PTH binds to the PTH receptors of the bone, what it does is it releases a substance called IL-1. IL-1 goes and binds to another receptor of the bone, which is called the osteoclast. It's only when IL-1 binds to the osteoclast, osteoclast becomes active and it starts breaking down bone okay the only receptor in the osteoclast that it has is for calcitonin Calci calcitonin osteoclast does not have pth receptor directly it does not it actually works through uh, osteoblast so pth binds to osteoblast osteoblast releases il1 IL-1 goes and binds to osteoclast and only then osteoclast becomes activated. Calcitonin has its receptor on his osteoclast and whenever we give calcitonin 
Uh, we usually give calcitonin for a patient who's going through osteoporosis. The osteoclast is going to be inhibited, and osteoclast is going to stop breaking down bone. So that's another kind of um, take on the whole vitamin D, PTH. Um, they're related to each other, so I just wanted to discuss it there. So anyway, so that is my interpretation of vitamin D. Oh, the last of all, vitamin D deficiency causes rickets in, um, in children, and they have bowing of legs because the bones are soft. They're also going to have rickettic rosary. That means on their vertebra, where the vertebra meets the sternum, there is going to be beating, right? Because they are going to be, the bone and the cartilage is going to expand a little bit so that they, you know, because they're softer and they're not mineralized, right? So we, we, it's called rickettic rosary, and it's quite visible. Even if you uh, lift up a boy's shirt or a girl's shirt, when they're a little boy and girl, you can see that there is beating along the vertebra. So that is also something we see in children. Uh, in adults, it can cause osteomalacia or soft bone. Osteomalacia or soft bone in adults. Okay. Another thing I want to talk about is that vitamin D is not present in breast milk. So it's very important to either supplement a child with vitamin D or take the child in the sun to expose the child um, to vitamin D. Okay, so that's another, another important aspect uh, of uh, the whole vitamin D pathogenesis. Last of all, anyone who is living in countries where there's less sun exposed areas, for example, Canada, those people should be exposed to sun uh, more often because sun is the one who makes our vitamin D, right? And people who are living in these countries, so less sun exposed and dark skin, they are even more prone to have vitamin deficiency because sun cannot reach the, reach the skin as easily as someone who is fair skin. So, so dark skin people should take vitamin D supplements and try to get as much sun as possible or else they're going to be vitamin D deficient. Last clinical correlation is sarcoidosis. So in sarcoidosis, we see vitamin D, increase in vitamin D. That's because sarcoidosis stimulates the macrophages. Okay, interesting. It's coming from the macrophages. It stimulates the macrophages to make more vitamin D or the epithelioid cells to make more epithelioid macrophages to make more vitamin D. So that's why we see a vitamin D increase or calcium increased in sarcoidosis or hypercalcemia in sarcoidosis. So that's, that's all I know about vitamin D.